like to thank uh, all those uh, yesterday who decorated the church. Did a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, I know there was Richard here as well, and so I'm uh, very, very thankful for that. Um, so this morning, again, we're not returning to the Gospel of Matthew at this point in time. We'll uh, just uh, uh, reserve that for the new year, and we will be beginning in uh, Matthew 23 in the new year, probably the second week or third week of January. So this morning, being uh, Christmas, being the season of Christmas, we're looking at, uh, I want to look at the Gospel of Luke, and today's title is Christ's Birth Declared. Christ's birth declared and reading from Luke 1 26 to 38. I may have preached on this last year, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's, uh, it's a different sermon. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Luke 1 26. In the sixth month, of uh, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, uh, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he uh, will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. <clears throat> Verse 34 to the end, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord, that it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this account, and we thank you for Mary, who was a godly woman, Lord, and we thank you that she was a willing vessel to be used by you. And Lord, we have much to learn from her and uh, her faithfulness, and also from what the, the account of the text is saying to us. So we ask for your blessing as we look into uh, your wonderful word, and we ask that your spirit would be our teacher, our guide today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Therefore, as we ponder the, the details and the events surrounding uh, Christ's birth, we immediately see that it was a time of miracles and wonder. Truly, it was a time to celebrate. And interestingly, that it was also a time, uh, it was not a time where there, it was headline news. This was not on the 6 o'clock news. <laughs> Um, and um, for it was mostly a silent event. And that's very interesting, isn't it? Known only by a small number of people. And our God chose for it to be this way. Christ came under the humblest of circumstances. And we see our Lord's humility, our God's humility, and Christ's meekness. And meekness, as I learned many years ago, it means power under control. As God Almighty who came into the world, he chose to humble himself and to, to uh, restrain, we can say, his power. He set aside his glory temporarily and the glory that he had in heaven itself. Now Luke wrote this gospel under the uh, direction and supervision of the Apostle Paul because Luke was a companion of the Apostle Paul and so it is believed that he wrote uh, these, this gospel. Now, Luke was not an apostle itself, uh, per se, but uh, we know that uh, he was with Paul. And so we read the following here in verse 1 to verse 4, very interesting. And, and Luke says, Inasmuch as many have uh, undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have uh, been accomplished among us. So Luke chose to sat down with the supervision and direction of the apostle Paul. And this was maybe a decade later, 15 years later or more. And so he wrote these words, 
It says here, verse 2, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for, for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Verse 4, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And so, here briefly, Luke wrote for the edification of Theophilus. Uh, some have said that Theophilus, which means lover of God, uh, Theos, God, Phileo, uh, which means love. And so maybe he's, uh, he was speaking to the church in general, but I think he was, it was a person, because he said, does say here, most excellent Theophilus. But we know by application, it applies to all of us. It is written for all of us, for all believers, that we may be strengthened in our faith, being assured of God's great love and provision in sending us His Son. <clears throat> These things are rooted in history, and that we rejoice. Mm -hmm. As Luke recounts these things, and in this, again, we rejoice. <clears throat> As we consider the events surrounding Mary, the passage we have read uh, already, we see several things of significance in the passage before us. I have five points, and uh, point number one is, first of all, we see a divine visitation. A divine visitation. Verse 26, 27 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, angels are God's messengers. We don't see them. I'm certain there are angels here with us today. Uh, Word of God says in Hebrews 4, uh, 1 verse 14, it says, uh, regarding angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So we see there in the Word of God, angels are ministering spirits. How many of us can make the claim that we've had a visitation by an angel of God? And uh, in the same manner as Mary, I can say that none of us can make that claim because this was unique. Uh, this was part of God's plan of redemption where in the fullness of time we see Christ coming into the world and we see with special events, special interventions, God does reveal more of his word, of his plan of redemption. And so God sent uh, forth his son. And we see this in order to fulfill all that God had promised even from the foundation of the world. And the angel Gabriel was sent by God to visit Mary this godly young lady, to minister to her as one in obedience to God himself. So Mary was a young lady. Uh, I looked it up a little bit, and uh, maybe they think she was maybe 15 or 16, and so people would marry young, uh, very young in those days. And um, now uh, Mary and Joseph, they would have been engaged uh, at, here at this point, and I'll talk more about that later on. And according to the genealogy in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, Joseph was of the lineage of David, which is a fulfillment of Scripture. And we'll look at that a bit later, on, later on as well. And according to the genealogy in Luke, we see that even Mary was of the lineage of David. So both of them were of the lineage of, of David, distant cousin, distant relatives. And thus, here we have the angel Gabriel sent by God visiting a young lady by the name of Mary, who was a virgin. So point number one, a divine visitation. Point number two, a divine declaration. Let's we'll spend more time on this one. Uh, we're looking here at verse 28, verse 30 to 32. It seemed clear to me that our God loves to, uh, he loves to reveal himself to fallen creatures. He really enjoys that, such as we see here in the scripture. We see in the Old Testament how time and time again our God would declare, reveal himself, and in doing so, he was also revealing a little bit more about his plan of redemption. That's what God was doing from the Old Testament, revealing a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more about who he is and his plan of redemption. So again, and I believe that God is greatly pleased to make himself known to us. He delights to make himself known to us. He is joyful, as we see here in verse 28. 
And he came, the angel came to her, Mary, and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. So I'm sure, you know, the angel had a smile on his face. It was a time of rejoicing, a time of celebration. The word favored one here, favored, means one given special honor. So Mary was given special honor. And uh, let me say that there's no greater honor, there's no greater special honor to carry in your womb the Lord of glory. <laughs> she was blessed <laughs> among all of humanity. And, and so the, uh, here the words, the Lord is with you, it's, uh, we see that in Scripture in many places. We see with, with Gideon, when God called him to, to liberate uh, Israel, and it says in uh, Judges 6, 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon, and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And so the Lord was with Gideon as well. So the Lord was with Mary. This speaks of God's presence. It speaks of God's power in order to carry out a God-given task. And God was giving her uh, the ability to, and the grace to carry out a God-given task. And she was God's chosen vessel for such a, a time as this, to bring forth into the world the long-awaited Son of God, the Messiah. And we have to understand that women also have a great role to play in God's plan of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. Women do. And women may think, well, uh, I can't be a preacher, I can't I don't preach. And, but no, God can use you in mighty ways, and he does. So therefore, here we see the greatest honor was given to a woman and not to a man. In this divine declaration, we see furthermore, verse 30, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And so I asked myself the question, why would the angel say to Mary, Don't be afraid, Mary? Well, obviously, it's because she was afraid. <laughs> she, there was fear. Why wouldn't she be afraid? Well, seeing a holy, sinless, divine, heavenly being before you is a cause of great fear. Seeing uh, in that process, seeing your own sinfulness, seeing that you are unworthy, seeing that you are a sinner, and here is a being that is completely sinless. I mean, it would put fear in any, any one of us. You think of uh, John, who, who <laughs> fell down as, as dead you know, before the Lord Jesus, and, and uh, we see all of that. And so we see in this, it is also a sudden visitation, and, uh, and a visitation from a heavenly being would cause an, any believer to tremble with God in fear. It was sudden, and uh, I don't know what Mary was doing before, beforehand, but the angel appeared, I'm sure in a gracious way, not to just to make her jump, but uh, he was there and appeared suddenly. Thus, the angel speaks to assure her that this visit is for good and for her well-being, that God would bless her, that God would bless her. Furthermore, we see in the verse, verse 30, for you have found favor with God. What does that mean? You have found favor with God. Favor is the word charis in the Greek, which means grace or favor, because we know when God saves us, he, he gives us grace, and uh, which is salvation. Salvation is by the grace of God alone, and we know that salvation is completely something that we do not deserve, and it is by the grace of God. So grace is God's gift, undeserved gift. And so here we see a contrast regarding Noah. In Genesis 6, 8, but Noah was found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So Mary found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God poured upon her extra grace. Uh, here's a quote. The issue is God's gracious choice, not Mary's particular piety. For unlike Luke 1 and 6, nothing is made of Mary's personal piety, either before or after this verse. The emphasis is God's sovereign choice, not on, a, on human acceptability. It's not because she was, like, she was like sinless. No, she was a sinner just like everyone, everyone else. But God chose to use her as the vessel. Simply put, God chose to choose her as a woman who was a believer and God-fearing, for it could not be that God would bring forth his son into the world through a woman who had no love for God. 
God would not have done that for someone who was ungodly, someone who was uh, habitually sinning and, and cursing the name of God. No, she was a godly woman. So here's the great announcement in verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The message is clear. Mary, you will conceive. The baby will be a boy, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now Mary and Joseph had, uh, had not been together yet to consummate their marriage, and so uh, by, I looked into this many years ago, it appears to me that Hebrew weddings were different, or different than ours, and so they were legally married, but yet some time would go by before they would actually uh, finalize the, the uh, finish the final stage of their marriage, where they would move in together and consummate their marriage. So at this point, they were, had not moved in together. They were legally married. And uh, so we find uh, these words given to uh, Mary, you shall call his name Jesus, reminds me of what we see in Matthew 1, 20 and 21. Here is, uh, here is Joseph. Now, with God appearing to Mary, I've thought about this many times. So, like, I can't believe that Mary would have just kept everything to herself. She would have said to, to Joseph, oh, I'm married, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm pregnant, and, uh, uh, and then Joseph would have said, like, how? <laughs> Who's the man? Uh, I'm not telling you, it's a secret. No, no, there's no doubt in my mind she would have shared that with him. An angel came to me and told me, and this is what happened. And so we know in the account of Matthew, uh, Joseph was seeking to put her away secretly. He didn't want to just embarrass her publicly. And so we see in that uh, Joseph was a godly man, one who loved the Lord. But if we look at, if we see here in the passage of Matthew 1, 20 and 21. But as he uh, considered these things, that is to put her away, to divorce her, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for well, that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, which is what no doubt Mary, what Mary would have told him. Verse 21, she will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus. What did the angel say to, to uh, Mary? You shall call his name Jesus. And so here is the angel appearing to Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus. <laughs> Here's an affirmation. So it says here, for he will save his people from their sins. Oh. And the name of, for Jesus in the Hebrew is a form of the word to save. So Jesus is our Savior, and we know that. And this is the fulfillment of what was prophesied in Isaiah. Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. We see his, how it is promised in Scripture. Furthermore, verse 32, as we continue on this topic of the divine de declaration, <coughs> Verse 32, it says here, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. So there's three things that we see here. It says here, He will be great. He will be great. So this greatness contrasts with the rest of humanity, which is not great. I'm not great. I'm not great. None of us are great. Jesus is great. And also with uh, the greatness of John the Baptist, whose greatness was not an absolute, but qualified with, it says here in uh, Luke 1, 15, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Thus Jesus and John were both alike great and, uh, and different. Jesus' greatness is an, un is, an is an unqualified greatness. In other words, for Jesus, he does not need to uh, need the added in the sight of the Lord, implying that maybe Jesus was just a man. For Jesus, he's also the Son of God, Messiah, as we see. Jesus, Jesus is one who is great. Secondly, in this verse, we see not only will his name be Jesus, which the angel said to, um, to Joseph and Mary, but he will also be called the Son of the Most High. He will be called the Son of the Most High. What does that mean? Well, it means that he is the Son of God. The Son of God is a title of deity. Jesus is known to be greater than John the Baptist, for John is described as a prophet of the Most High in Luke 1, 7, 
70, uh, Luke 176, whereas Jesus is described as the Son of the Most High. So that, it's very interesting. John the Baptist is called the Prophet of the Most High, but Jesus is called the Son of the Most High. These two verses alone, the, the true humanity of Jesus and his divine nature. How can someone claim that Jesus was just a man on earth and that uh, he was not God? And there are those among the Word of Faith movement that is a heresy, and they teach this, that uh, Jesus on earth was not God. It is a heresy, friends. We see even in this verse alone that Jesus is both truly man and truly God. So we see the true humanity and divine nature of Jesus are fundamental doctrines upon which our faith is built. Uh, third point in this verse, it says that he will be given the throne of his father David, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, it says in verse 32. This speaks of Jesus as our Messiah King, a descendant of King David. Uh, we look in uh, 2 uh, Samuel 7.12, it says, when your days are fulfilled, God speaking to David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up uh, your offspring after you who, uh, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And so we see that uh, here, this is a fulfillment of scripture. He'll be given, um, he will give him the throne of his father David. We also see in verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, uh, there will be no end. He will reign over the house of Jacob, and his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. So continuing on the same uh, theme of king of Israel, here we see house of Jacob. What does that mean? Well, basically it means it's, traditional, it's a traditional term to describe Israel, the house of Israel. It synthesizes again the kingship of Christ, and also fulfilled uh, we see here in um, uh, the end of this verse, verse 33, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You see that fulfilled in 2 Samuel 7, 13. So, shall, uh, so he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You see how scripture is fulfilled time and time again. So the third point this morning, we saw first of all a divine visitation, a divine declaration, and now I want to say a, we see here in the text a very human response. A very human response, of course, from Mary. Verse 29 and also um, verse 34. Verse 29, it says here, But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. So Mary reveals her true humanness here. All of us would have responded in that way. There are some who try to exalt Mary over and above what, what the Scripture reveals. But no, she was a human being just like all of us. She was a sinner just like every one of us. Not only was she troubled here in the text, but she was greatly troubled. That means she was greatly disturbed. She was distur disturbed wholly within herself, within her being. She was so agitated by this visit, by this declaration. And so here is Mary, who was simply trying to live out her life and preparing for her wedding. And now she's also preparing for a baby shower. <laughs> As a young believer, she had her own plans mapped out. You know, get married, um, uh, have a home, work from home possibly, have many children, and uh, support my husband. You know, just a simple life. Just to live a simple life. But now God has presented before her a glorious life. <laughs> a glorious life. If a believer has his heart set on the things of God, understand that God may come and give you a totally new direction. If you say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to, I'm surrendering my life over to you day after day. God may say, okay, I'm going to test you. I'm going to redirect your life in a way that you never imagined. And all, many of us can make that claim. We can say that, yeah, that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. <laughs> but I'm still serving the Lord. I'm faithful to the Lord. I want to be. I love Him. And I praise Him. And so we see this happening to this young lady, Mary. And so we, uh, it reminds me of what we see in Proverbs 16, verse 9. The heart of man plans his own way, but the Lord establishes his steps. 
it's perfectly fine for us to map out our lives as best as we can. But in the Lord, you know, we say we see uh, events happening in our lives, basically causing our lives to go in a different direction. So that's what the Lord does in our lives. So as with all believers, a divine intervention would cause us to try to discern the purpose and, and the will of God. Why me? Why has this happened to me? What, what, what's going on, Lord? What is happening? And furthermore, we see regarding the true humanity of Mary, verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? This is a valid response, a valid question. <laughs> Imagine talking back to an angel and saying, well, how, how is this possible? <laughs> i never been with a man. So, because she was a chaste woman. And so we see that she had honored God with her life, her mind, her heart, and also her body. Her body belonged to God. So a good question is, again, how is that possible? Mary raising that question. Me being pregnant, but I've, I've never been with a man. So with these words, she was confessing her personal holiness as a believer. She was revealing that I am a, 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 a virtuous woman. I am a godly woman. I will not do that. And God would expect this young woman, young Mary, to respond in this way with a valid question. Because, again, this is a unique situation, a very puzzling situation, where she would have needed to raise that question. Number four, a divine miracle. A divine miracle. Here is the answer to your question, Mary. This is a miracle from God. That's the answer. It's a miracle from God. Verse 35, and the angel answered her, this is a moving, really moving text. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The same Holy Spirit spoken about, spoken about throughout the Old Testament, He will come upon you, Mary. And with the Holy Spirit upon you, God's power will also be present, described specifically as an overshadowing. So it says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. It's one of those terms that we don't use every day. And what exactly does it mean? Well, I've got a, bit, a little bit of help from some friends of mine, <laughs> um, on uh, commentators and other scholars. So the word of, uh, for overshadow carries the sense of the holy, powerful presence of God. The holy, powerful presence of God, as in the description of the cloud that covered of the tabernacle in the Old Testament when the tent was filled with the glory of God. This is known as the Shekinah glory of God. The word is used, this word here, overshadowed, is used in all three accounts of the transfiguration. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Well, it's, that word is used in all three accounts um, to describe the overshadowing of the cloud. Likewise, in each account, the voice comes out of the cloud, identifying Jesus as God's Son. A striking reminder of Luke 1.35, where the life that results from the enveloping cloud is identified as the Son of God. That's God's miracle. So Jesus being conceived in Mary's womb is the miraculous work of God alone. We also see in verse 36, 37, and behold, the angel says to, to Mary, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with, uh, with her who was called barren. Remember years ago, when I was, uh, maybe a year before I went to seminary in Toronto, uh, my friend and I met uh, a fellow in the park who was a Muslim and a nice fellow, but he was essentially mocking our faith. And he was saying that, oh, the account of Jesus, that's not the only one where the Holy Spirit did, did the work. He says, you know, look at John, John the Baptist, and, and, but he doesn't read the text properly. Mm -hmm. What happened here is essentially what happened with Abraham and, and Sarah, where God opened the womb of Sarah so that she would conceive in the, in the, the natural way with, with the relations of a husband and a wife. And so that's what is described here. But with Jesus, again, it is completely different. It is an overshadowing of uh, the Holy Spirit. And... Finally, it says here, for nothing will be impossible with God. 
nothing would be impossible with God. <clears throat> God can't contradict himself, of course, <laughs> but he is a God of the miraculous. And so the angel here cites the pregnancy of Elizabeth <clears throat> as further evidence of God's marvelous power and concludes with the grand affirmation, verse 37, surely one of the most uh, reassuring statements in all the scripture, for nothing will be impossible with God. You're having troubles and trials in your life. Go to God. He will help you. He will help you. He will help you. At every turn in my life, he has helped me. He will help you. He will help you to establish your life, your faith. He will, he's the one who will strengthen your faith. Turn, turn to him. Run to him. Cry out to God in prayer. So fourthly, a divine miracle. Number five, final point, a believer's submission. A believer's submission. Luke 1, 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary had her own plans for her life with Joseph. As we saw, she had all things plan in her life. I'm going to get married and have children and raise them and just have a simple life, so she thought. And, and with this divine intervention, her life to took a totally new direction for which she had not planned. The Word of God does say that Mary and Joseph had other children. Uh, their names are, are, are mentioned, at least the, for the boys. So they had children together after they had Jesus. And so but here is Mary and Joseph having the challenge and the blessing of raising the only perfect child. Parents will sometimes boast and say, well, my child is perfect. What do you mean? <laughs> I wanted my child. But here is uh, Mary could say, my child is perfect. <laughs> Try to raise a perfect child. You can never say to Jesus, go to your room. <laughs> and so he, Jesus is the one by his own perfection rebukes them. <laughs> And so, uh, can you imagine the, the tension with the siblings, uh, the half-brothers and sisters of, of Jesus, uh, of, of Joseph and Mary, where they just, yeah. they probably hated him, you know? Uh, because at one point in Scripture it says, that, uh, because his own brothers and sisters did not believe in him. They did not believe in him. And so, but we, by the grace of God, we know that James and Jude, they came to faith later on, and so they contributed to the Scriptures. <coughs> and so, regarding the... Uh, Words of, of Mary, where she says, Behold, I am the servant. The word here can mean slave. It's the word doulos, slave. I am the maid servant. Uh, and let it be to me according to your word. It reminds me of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. She was in submission to God. To what the angel said, Lord, may be to me according to your word. And, you know, oftentimes this is what our own personal struggles, right? So we, we have our own things planned out, and we want to go in this direction, but we have to submit before God and say, Lord, not my will be done, but yours be done. Yeah. And uh, so when trials come our way, we have to just sometimes just step back and just wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Just, trials will come. They will come. They have come in my life. They will come in your life. So when those come, just step back and wait. Don't try to get ahead of God's will. Wait for Him. Wait for Him to give you guidance and direction and to speak to you uh, in His own way. So, which raises again the question, will believers resist the will of God? Sometimes we do. We know that. We are in control of our circumstances. Many times God sends things our way for which we are oftentimes unprepared. We will cry out. Uh, we will cry. Uh, will we cry out? To the potter, as in Isaiah 45, you know, read the text uh, in your own time. The, so shall the clay say, say to the potter, what are you doing? You know, sometimes we re respond that way. Lord, what are you doing with me? Well, we're not going to do that. We are to submit. So our God is simply desires that we submit to his divine sovereign will and to trust him in whatever the Lord does in our lives. So again, the words of Mary, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary's beauty was an inward beauty. We don't know what she looks like, but no doubt she had an inward beauty where she had a heart in glad submission to God for her pregnancy. God's gift to her. 
Above all, this was no ordinary child. What an honor to carry with him her, the Son of God himself, the promised Messiah, the King of Israel. What an honor. And so she submitted to that role, to that task. Even though she was a sinner herself, but she raised within her womb the one who was perfect, but sinless, Christ, the Son of God. May the Lord bless all of us as we continue to ponder and meditate on God's majestic work in sending us His Son in the weeks to come. And what really I find quite uh, wonderful in all of this is that we can, may come to know Him personally. Christ has come, but we may come to know Him personally by believing on Him. If you don't know Christ this day, today, trust in Christ. Surrender your life over to Christ. Acknowledge that you are a sinner. Confess that you are a sinner. It's not a matter of confessing individual sins, which is true, but it's, a, it's about confessing our sinfulness, that we are sinful through and through, that we are bankrupt, and that, that we can't name them all. We can't name all of our sins. It's a surrender to God at His feet and uh, acknowledging that we are sinners and to place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we come to know the Lord. And I remember when I, back in 1983, that was a few years ago, when I was a believer, I, I became a Christian in February, and I remember when Christmas came along and I thought, now I understand what this is all about. It's about Jesus, <laughs> the Son of God who came and was born of a virgin. Mm. And I placed my trust in Him. So God calls upon all of us to place our trust in Christ, that we may become alive, spiritually alive, and born again of the Spirit of God. Amen. And the Lord bless uh, as we continue in the weeks to come to look on uh, various passages uh, regarding the birth of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice. We love you because you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, that you have done a work in our hearts that could have not have been done by anyone else but you. Huh. We thank you for the birth of Christ. We thank you for his uh, growth when he became a man. We thank you that he went to the cross uh, in obedience. And we thank you that he made uh, atonement for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that you call upon humanity, all of us here, to place our trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may come to know him and to enjoy him forever. Thank you, Lord, for our time. And bless each one here in Jesus' name. Thank <clears throat> you.